Our Bible reading this morning is from Acts chapter 17, reading the first 15 verses, but I plan uh, to expound most of the passage. The first 15 verses set the scene for what follows. So Acts chapter 17, and starting at verse 1. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city up in uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harboured them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. <clears throat> But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come with him to, with, to him with all speed, they departed. Sets an interesting scene, doesn't it? Well, I've spent a couple of months wandering through a series which I have described the great sermons in Acts. I hope that this series has been both educational and edifying. Again, if you want to catch up with the previous editions, you can log on to YouTube and search for my Warri Community Church. I was speaking to someone the other day and I was somewhat surprised myself to remind them that we've got sermons from church going back to March 2020. So we've been doing this, well, we've been doing that for quite a while. And certainly uh, the series, the great, the great Sermons in Acts, is on YouTube. This morning, before moving on to another theme, I want us to consider just one of the late great sermons in Acts from our reading passage, Acts chapter 17. And truth to be told, the sermon which was the catalyst for me considering all the others in the first place. I started out thinking I should preach on Acts 17. And I thought, well, what about all the other sermons in Acts? So that's where it started from and that's where it's resulted too. This is Paul, the great teacher of the faith, preaching in what is certainly the intellectual capital city of the Roman Empire. As such, it is intellectually rigorous, but at the same time, truly inspiring as Paul walks the greatest minds of his day through the nature and character of God, the resurrection of Jesus, against the background of rampant idolatry and superstition, much like today, I would have thought. So let's think about the background for just a minute before we move into the text itself. The only part of the chapter provides us with the explanation as to why Paul is in Athens and why he's alone, which we will find out in a minute. Paul's preaching at Thessalonica had resulted in a riot and his party being expelled from the city and so they moved on to Berea. My dad used to say preaching should invoke either a revival or a riot. And if it does either one, it's doing its job. 
And so Paul, preaching in Thessalonica, provoked a riot. It was doing its job. Here, there is a much better reception in Berea, but the mob from Thessalonica follow him, and fearing that Paul's influence will be replicated there, they stir up the people there. Paul's party, fearing for his life, Luke and the rest of the party send him away to Athens while they, that's Silas and Timothy, stayed on ministering in Berea. <clears throat> Paul was, we read there, conducted to Athens. That's what my translation said, with the command that Silas and Timothy join him as soon as possible. So the stage is set. Paul is alone in Athens, perhaps alone for the first time since he started preaching many years earlier. There's always been at least one or two people with him throughout all these journeys. Barnabas, Silas, certainly Luke, and certainly others. Here, now, he doesn't know anybody. He's by himself. Luke tells us that the people who delivered into Athens, in the last verse, I always find that rather humorous, the last part of verse 15, the people who delivered into Athens dropped him off and then buzzed off and went back to Berea. So here, Paul... Here's Athens. Now we're off, you know, and here's Paul stuck in Athens, you know. Uh, I don't know how he looked after himself. I don't know how he was accommodated. But they just dropped him off at Athens and went back to Berea. So what does a preacher of the gospel do when he finds himself with time on his hands? That's the question, isn't it? What to do? Paul looks around and what he sees prompts perhaps one of his greatest sermons. And in my book, one of the greatest sermons in the whole of the New Testament. The sermon on Mars Hill by the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> so we read in verse 16, coming on now from our reading. While Paul waited for them, that Silas and Timothy, at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Now we preach and read here from the New King James Version, but I'm an old King James person as well. And I know that the King James Version says his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. That's an interesting slant on the words, isn't it? Uh, the New King James says given over to. The King James Version says wholly given to idolatry. It's important for us Western Christians in the 21st century to understand that our world is nothing like the ancient world. Nothing like it with respect to religion. We live in a thoroughly irreligious world. There are churches, many of them grand, on every corner, but they are a pale shadow of the past when they were built in terms of the number of people worshipping in them. The children and grandchildren of the people who built them are at the football on Sunday morning, not at church. Atheistic pressure groups of every persuasion are trying to wipe out all traces of religion from our society, from our governments, from our schools, from our courts, from our streets. They've already succeeded in that. You can't preach in the streets anymore. And if possible, from our homes, reaching right to the most fundamental level of life. I should point out that militant atheism is not just directed at Christianity, although we notice it because we're the ones affected by it. Militant atheism is directed at all religion. Militant atheism says we will not be satisfied until we have succeeded in turning all mankind into people with no thought for God in any form, in any representation, in any religion. And that includes Islam, Judaism, Shintoism, Hinduism, all the great religions of the world and all the minor ones as well. They need to be abolished. They need to be put out of people's minds. Evolution and its handmade humanism have no place for God in any expression. We are creatures who have risen by our own efforts from the earth and every advance that has been made has been by our own efforts and without the aid of a God. So they teach. As soon as even the idea of God is wiped out from human consciousness, then the next great leap forward in man's evolution will be achieved. This is the moral and intellectual backdrop for our evangelism. And keep that in mind. I might also mention that it's also the intellectual backdrop for the anti-God climate change movement. We may have something to say about that at another time. But the ancient world, the word of Paul, was exactly the opposite to what the atheists are trying to achieve. It was a world filled with gods 
And every person in it was a worshipper of a god or gods. Every person in it. Everybody was religious. Now, the religion was perverted, but everybody was religious. There were no atheists in Athens on the day that Paul found himself at loose end in Athens. Even the whole of the Roman Empire. There was no atheists in the whole of the Roman Empire. The empire was founded on religion, perverted as we know. But nonetheless, religion was intertwined with government, with the army, and with the very highest levels of authority. The Caesars, the emperors, the top of the food chain in the Roman Empire, starting with Caligula in 41 BC, and Julius Caesar following him, had declared themselves to be gods and invited and demanded the worship of the people in the same way that we worship God today, with the same level of veneration and reverence as we give to our God today. And the following Caesars, those in Paul's day, continued that tradition. <clears throat> this pagan worship of a myriad of gods was characterised by the display all across the Roman world of idols and statues and shrines and temples, all drawing the attention of Roman citizens to the existence of and their dependence on the gods, whoever they happened to be. Judaism alone, which stood for one invisible God, not worshipped by idols, was so ingrained in society that the Romans couldn't get rid of it without huge disruption, so they tolerated it. But as far as they were concerned, everyone else worshipped the gods, and everybody from cradle to grave worshipped the gods. Now, we might find the idea of gods and shrines and idols dedicated there too on every street corner a bit bizarre. But this was the ancient world. And this was Athens on the day when Paul found himself at a loose end in the second greatest city in the Roman Empire. To paraphrase Luke, Paul got mad. His spirit was stirred within him when he saw this city wholly given to idolatry. What is a gospel preacher to do when confronted with something so polaring, so polarizing the opposite to the faith of Jesus Christ and the teachings of the Holy Scriptures? What's a gospel preacher to do? Well, we read in verse 17, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace with those who happened to be there. Now I can understand the synagogue. Everywhere where Paul went, he went first to the synagogue. Paul tells us in Romans that the gospel is to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Paul always took the gospel to the Jew first. Christians today across the world are trying to take the gospel to the Jews. And there is some success happening in doing that. So Paul went to the synagogue. But I love Paul's Luke's allusion in the latter part of the verse to what Paul was doing. He says he went to the synagogue and to the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. And I was reading that thinking, here's this image in mind of, of someone walking past and Paul buttonholing and someone saying, hey, come here for a minute, I want to talk to you about the gospel. You know, Sort of grassroots, in-your-face evangelism from this great preacher. Such radical preaching of such a radical message soon, soon drew the attention of the eggheads of the day. We read in verse 18, certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler have to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Paul's message is completely at odds with the whole religious fabric of the day. It's not just a little bit out there. It's not just a permutation of what they've already got. It's completely different. And obviously, it draws attention. <clears throat> the religious people are bewildered by Paul preaching about another God, Jesus, who has risen from the dead. What are they to make of such new and challenging concepts? This is not contained in the Jew in the even in the Jewish religion, and certainly not contained in their pagan religions. So we read in verse 19: they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, or Mars Hill, as the translation in English is, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. That sounds like a good request, doesn't it? But then we read, For all the Athenians, 
and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So what's the English word for that sort of attitude? These were just egghead gossipers, weren't they? They just want to have their ears tickled. They just want to have a philosophical argument about something. They really weren't that interested in the gospel. It was just something new, and maybe there was a chance to have a long-term discussion about it. And so they said, we want to hear about this. Luke dispels the thought that these men were serious seekers after truth. These were just idle layabouts, bored with life and needing some intellectual stimulation, much like the philosophers of our day, I would dare say. Philosophy, it must be pointed out, is not a science seeking an answer. Its sole purpose is to argue endlessly and to no purpose other than the enjoyment of the argument about the meaning of life and the universe and everything. Who, who's read Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? No one's read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Gracious me. Well, the illustration's a bit lost, but in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, they want to know the, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And these two philosophers build this gigantic computer to find the answer. It takes six million years. And when they find the answer, the answer's 42. So they're a bit dismayed about that. What does that mean? Well, they have to build another computer to find out what the question should have been. And then they're worried because they think if a, if a computer can find the answer, then they're philosophers and they're going to be what? Out of a job. Because we don't want a bag of nuts and bolts telling us the answer because then we can't sit here for millions of years endlessly arguing about it. So philosophy is a little bit like that. I'm not suggesting you read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but it's pretty harmless. You'll get the joke when you read it. So thinking again about 21st century Goulburn, how is the Christian to respond to the scrutiny and intellectual and philosophic thought that pervades our society today? We must avoid the trap of getting involved in argument on a philosophic basis. We must avoid that. This is crucial. Now, Paul is a man of great intellect. There's no doubt about that. Well capable of matching it with these men in intellectual parry and thrust, I am sure. But he cleverly, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, avoids going down the hypothetical path and sticks to the facts. This might have been a bit inconvenient for them, but Paul knew where he was going and the Spirit of God is guiding him well away from the path, I'm sure, that they would have liked. We must do the same. If we as Christian people are going to be effective in witnessing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, let's not get tangled up in philosophical arguments. Let's just go to the core. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Let's stay there. And if they try and drag us away from it, well, we can go a little bit, but the rubber band should bring us straight back, must bring us straight back. Our argument and dialogue must have a purpose and a finite and identifiable end. And that finite and identifiable end is to bring people to a realisation of sin and of the necessity for them to come to Christ and be saved. All other argument around that, intellectual, philosophical, may help, but it'll probably get in the way of this core message. So Paul, instead of tickling the ears of the hearers, <clears throat> he goes straight for the religious juggler vein. We read in verse 22, Then Paul stood in the middle of Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. He starts out very courteously. No need to insult them and cut off the opportunity for preaching. They're going to get annoyed later on anyway. But don't, don't insult them to start with. Um, the King James Version I did note there reads the verse as you are too superstitious. And we can understand why the wonderful old bishops who gave us the King James Version for 500 years ago used those words. These men are on Paul's side, you know. They're the enemy. Paul's the friend. Let's say that Paul said they were too superstitious. But... Very religious is probably a better translation of the Greek in terms of what Paul is trying to say here. You people are soaked in religion. I see everywhere that you are soaked in religion. So how and why does Paul say that they are very religious? Or if you want to, how and why does Paul say you people are too superstitious? What prompts him to say that? Well, he says, For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. 
Now, the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods, if you want to talk about the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods or all sorts of stuff, please consult with Hazel later. She's an expert in ancient history and especially in Greco-Roman. She did all that stuff in school and she's taught that stuff and she knows 10 times more about it than I do. But I'm, I've been doing my research with her and a little bit on the internet as well. The Greco-Roman pantheon of gods covered every aspect of life thought and action. There was nothing that you could do, say or think that was not covered by the demands and the protection, if necessary, of a god, sometimes of several gods. All the gods had names and well-defined attributes and available actions. But just in case they'd missed one, Paul says, you've got a catch-all altar over there and it is to the unknown god. See, there may just be another one who we haven't put a name on yet. And we don't want to offend him by not having an altar to him. So we'll put an altar here and we'll say, we don't know his name, but we'll just say to the unknown God. And we look at that and say, well, they haven't got my name, but I'm not offended because they at least made an effort. That's the mentality that's going on here. And you can see that Paul is lampooning this idea. You can see that Paul is lampooning this action. Um, the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods did all those things. To a monotheist like Paul, this must have seen the ultimate stupidity. Not only are they worshipping all sorts of gods, but they're covering all their bases by assuming the existence of an unknown god. Did you notice there, Paul says, as I passed by and I saw your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown god. I was amazed by the stuff that I found, and then I was even more amazed when I found to the unknown god. What? I mean, seriously, what? It's hard to avoid the wonder and perhaps sarcasm in that little word. Well, Paul's not having any of that. <clears throat> he gives the unknown God an identity and a name. He says in 23b, Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Now, lest you think that he's just playing with words there, that's as groundbreaking an action as it would be if someone went down to the War Memorial in Canberra to the shrine to the unknown soldier and said, I know the man's name and wrote it on the side of the grave. Uh, the RSL will probably be up in arms and several other interested groups will be up in arms. I, uh, as, a re as a retired soldier myself, I would think, A, it's not necessary, it's a bit tacky and why would you meddle with things like that? But Paul now is saying... That unknown God, who you've even got an altar for him, I know his name. And I'm going to tell you about him. Wow. So I don't know what they thought when they dragged him up to Mars Hill and said, tell us some new thing. I'm sure they weren't expecting this. Can you imagine the impact of that statement on his hearers? This man claims to know the identity of the God that we don't know. Offering any excuse or acknowledgement of the philosophical process or practice launches straight across the bowels of the idolatry of the day by preaching the God who they don't know, but who they need to know. He preaches God as the creator. Look at verse 24 and 17. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things. <clears throat> Once again, as I've noted here many times before, the Apostle Paul was a creationist. And I want any Christian who isn't a creationist to tell me why Paul was a creationist and they're not. I think that's a simple question to ask, isn't it? Now, if we had time, and we don't, we could go through the greco romian pantheon, and if you're interested, again, as I said, talk to Hazel, and identify each god and their attributes and their areas of responsibility. But for one moment, let's just stick with origins, shall we? Paul just said, the unknown God, that person over there who you can't name but I know, made the world. Rome had no God who existed before the start of the Roman state. Rome had no creator God. The Greek religion had no creator God. Their main gods were responsible for looking after Rome and its citizens. But they taught no god or goddess as responsible for the earth and its beginnings. Their reasoning was, if it happened before us, it's not important. The whole world started with us and anything that's happening now is important. But, you know, there might have been gods sometime around, but 
They have no creator God. So Paul's opening statement is outrageous and without precedent. The unknown God who you have got an altar to here, that God made the world and everything in it and gives to everything in it life and breath. Whoa, hang on. That's cutting right across the Greek Roman religion. Not only is he the creator God, and not only did he make the world, but he is not part of that world, but Lord over it. Now, brethren, can I stress here how important biblical creationism is. God is the creator of this world, but he is not part of this world. He is over and above it and Lord of it. He is not part of it. He is not subject to what happens with it. He is the master of what happens with it. And we need to understand that as a firm theology. If the weather gets bad, God doesn't, caught up in, God doesn't get caught up in bad weather. If the climate's changing, it's not because God's forgotten something. God is not connected in terms of being part of the fabric of this creation. We need to understand that. We need to know what that means as far as the doctrine is concerned. How unlike the petty, squabbling, carnal gods of Rome. Paul says, God doesn't need you. And he doesn't need anything, in fact. He exists separate from you, independent of you, <coughs> and above you. Now, Paul's taken a roadside altar and he started to ramp it up quite a bit, hasn't he? Mm. Just getting to here. <clears throat> this is a staggering statement, unmatched by anything in the rest of the Scripture. Look what he says here. There's more. He says in verse 26, And he, that is God, has made from one blood... Every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. It's very easy reading scripture to read over text that doesn't sort of have immediate sort of catchwords in it, catchphrases in it. It's very dangerous to read scripture like that. Listen to what Paul says here. He says two things. God is the sovereign creator and he has made of one blood all human beings on the face of the earth. No matter their colour, no matter their gender, no matter where they live, and God is also the determiner of where they live and how long they live there. Now the Roman Empire said, you know, we'll conquer whoever we like and we'll take whatever land we like and we'll keep it for as long as we like, except for that pesky little village up in France. Uh, the rare asterisk live. They, they never quite got their hands on that one, did they? <laughs> See, you imagine, you imagine the, the Romans listening to Paul saying, my God, that God, has made all humanity of one blood. But I'm a Roman. You know, I'm much superior uh, to the peasants of Greece. I'm much superior to the peasants of the Germanic tribes. God says, you're all made from the one blood. And wherever you live is not because of military might or chance, it's because God has determined where you are going to be. Not only that, he's determined how long you're going to stay there. The Roman Empire, of course, eventually fell because God determined that it was time for it to fall. Very simple, isn't it? And Paul doesn't pause for breath here because he teaches God is the sovereign creator <clears throat> and he has also determined where people live and for how long and that this situation has a purpose. Look at verse 27. He says he has made of one blood all nations to live on the face of this earth and determine the place where they are and the bounds of their habitation so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Paul says God moves humanity around the chessboard of life according to his own purposes, to create a situation where they will be moved to look for God and seek after God. <coughs> the altar is to the unknown God, right? Paul says that that God, the creator and sustainer and sovereign God, is able to be found and known. In fact, Paul says, he desires to be found and known. He's doing to you what he is doing to you to make you realize that he can be found and known to lead you to himself so that you might find him. 
He is close by. He's not living away in some, what's Mount Olympus, wasn't it? Up there on Mount Olympus where the gods and goddesses are squabbling with each other and fighting over the spoils and everything. He's not up there. He says, he's right here near you. He's close by. He gives us life and reason to live, even though you may not realize it. Paul here, uh, <laughs> always laugh at this rather cheekily, shows off his rich and varied knowledge of the subject in general by quoting a Roman poet. Doesn't one of your Roman poets say, for we also are his offspring? You, you believe this and this. Even one of your own poets says, we're the offspring of God. Where does the altar to the unknown God fit in with that? You're not making sense, you people. Now, Paul's building up to knock out punch here, isn't he? You can just feel it coming. Verse 29. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. If the unknown God, the one that I'm describing, is all that I describe him to be, do you think he needs temples and idols and altars? Now, that's a nice rhetorical question, but the answer is, of course. No, he doesn't. He doesn't need those things. Up until now, Paul has been informing. But now he cuts across the whole fabric of Roman religion. All your altars and idols are nothing and mean nothing, he says. They are not how God is worshipped, and they are not any help in approaching God. The whole business of approaching God and knowing God is in God's hands, and you cannot manipulate the process. God has created a process to let you know that he's there and to draw you to himself. It's not happening over there. In fact, he says, the altar to the unknown God and this whole mentality that you've got about the gods is ignorance. Ooh, hang on, sharply indrawn breaths, surely. Look at verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Brethren, Christian brethren, if you know the Lord this morning, idolatry is ignorance. Idolatry is ignorance. Paul proves the point by showing the craziness of the altar to the unknown God. God is not unknowable. God is knowable. I've just told you that. And not too far away either. And although he has put up with the ignorance of the facts that Paul has now taught, now they know the facts. These facts demand a response. Paul says, I've led you gently by the hand down this path. I've taken from here to here to here to here. Now you have to do something about it. Paul is not on a mission here to introduce yet another religion about which they can argue endlessly in debate. He's cutting off all other religion and demanding repentance, repentance from sin and a complete change of mind and thinking on the subject of God. Now, Paul's here as the theoreticians. They're not used to dealing in facts. So he's, he's got them at a bit of a disadvantage here. If Paul had just left his message here, even with the strident demand for change of mind and acknowledgement of sin, it might have failed its purpose. But Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knows this. So he drives home the last point. Can these matters be proven? Why, yes. Yes, of course they can. Verse 31, he says, Because he, God, has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all men, assurance of this to all, by raising him from the dead. Oh. Memorize verse 31 of Acts 17. You heard it here first. You probably heard it before anyway. But memorize Acts 17, 31. Very important verse. Yes. Judgment? Judgment? Hang on a second. We're, we're dealing in, in philosophy and theory here. Don't, don't, don't rock our boat with facts. Now, we don't have time this morning to trawl through the labyrinth of Greco-Roman theology, but simply to say that they believed in life after death, but in an incredibly complex path and process by which if you were a soldier or you'd been a good person, whatever that's supposed to mean, you got to go to the fields of Elysium and spend the rest of eternity there, doing not quite sure what. If you'd been bad, you had to serve out a period of torture and purification, and then you got to go to that place. What does that sound like? That sounds a bit like Rome's doctrine of purgatory. Sounds awfully like it to me. In fact, I wonder if that's where they got it from. Hmm, mm -hmm. thinking. Eternal punishment in the sense of hell did not exist in the Greco-Roman 
theology just didn't exist. Paul says, God has given assurance of all of these things by raising Jesus Christ from the dead and you will stand before him as your judge. So Paul's declaration that everyone will have to stand before Jesus Christ, the man who was raised from the dead, and be judged in righteousness is a chilling and different doctrine altogether. And I might say infinitely more scary. Surely, infinitely more scary. So what's the result? We're nearly at the end of the chapter. Paul's sermon draws a polarised result. Big surprise, happens everywhere else. Verse 32. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we'll hear you more on this matter. To be expected. Some people believed and joined with Paul. We read 33, so Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them was Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. That doesn't sound like a huge crowd. That's not 5,000 at Pentecost. That's just a handful of people. But some people were convinced. Some people were convinced and joined with Paul in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But for the vast majority, the medicine was all too harsh and unpalatable. They wanted to hear some new thing, but not this new thing. They just wanted something they could endlessly argue about and endlessly discuss but never come to any conclusion. They didn't want this message, this confrontational message. So there's a lot to learn from Paul's meeting on Mars Hill, isn't, it? isn't there? Paul was not overwhelmed by the task of addressing these educated men, perhaps in human terms, the cleverest of the clever in the world of their day. He did not attempt to debate their beliefs, their religion, beyond pointing out its failures and weaknesses. <clears throat> Now, back in the day, I used to work for an IBM company. IBM doesn't stand for I blame Microsoft. It stands for International Business Machines, just in case you're wondering about that. And IBM had this very carefully structured sales training regime. Even just for one product, they had a two-day training seminar for just one product. And two American fellows would come and they'd sit you down somewhere in a conference centre in Bondi Junction and ply you with stale sandwiches and cold tea and tell you all the stuff that you needed to know about IBM and their products. And IBM had one rule in selling anything. And the rule was you never talk about the opposition product. Because sometime in one of these seminars, someone would get up and say, well, you know, what do we say if someone says, well, Hewlett Packard's a better product? The answer was, we don't talk about Hewlett Packard. We just talk about IBM. We don't say they're good or bad. We just say, Here's what IBM will bring to your business. That was the rule of the game. And that was what you were trained to do. And as sales manager in my company, as I eventually was, that was the training that I gave to people who came along. Oh, Canon make typewriters. Yes, but we're only talking about IBM typewriters. You know? Oh, Hewlett Packard made printers. We're just talking about IBM printers. Okay? Keep the focus over here. Because the philosophy was if you acknowledge the opposition, then you get people thinking about the opposition. So we don't talk about the opposition. We just talk about IBM. Paul, obviously, 2,000 years ago, hadn't had the opportunity of enjoying the rich texture of IBM training. <coughs> but he did the right thing, didn't he? He didn't talk about their religion. He didn't talk about... He didn't say one single nasty thing about any of their gods, did he? He just said, have a look over here. See this unknown God? That's God. Jesus Christ is his son. You're going to stand before him in judgment one day. Oh, yes, but what about... now? we just talk about this over here, okay? Just concentrate over here, just for the moment. Let us not get involved as we seek to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us not get involved in the endless you say, we say arguments. Now, it's very easy to do that. Incredibly easy to do that. Someone says, oh, yes, but what about? And you know the answer because you've said it a hundred times before. Don't do it. Don't do it. Say, well, you know, we could talk about that at another time. But right at the moment, I want you to think about this over here. God is the sovereign creator. He is not part of this world. He is Lord over this world. And his son, Jesus Christ, is one day going to sit on the throne in judgment and you will have to stand before him. Let's talk about that. Well, this is much more interesting. Let's argue about this. Now, let's talk about this over here. Brethren, let's keep our focus. Time is short. I'm distressed beyond measure with the way in which American Christians are being suborned to get involved in the political process and march in the streets and carry on. Time is too short to be worrying about finite things about whether or not Donald Trump gets elected or whether or not Joe Biden gets elected. If we've got time to argue about that, we've got time to preach the gospel. 
What's the most important thing we should be doing? We should be taking people up on Mars Hill and saying, your philosophy is bunk. Your religion is false. Jesus Christ will one day sit on a throne and you'll have to stand before him. Doesn't matter what's happened in election. Doesn't matter what happened to all the other things. This is the focus of life. This is the big question. Let's concentrate on the big question. Let us point to the poverty of man religion and earth religion and point past these things to the sovereign God who created all things, including all men with one blood and determined the bounds of their habitation. Let us remind people that a holy God is not impressed by or interested in the worship of sinful men. He demands just two things, acknowledgement of his person and repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. A setting aside of humanistic belief and an acknowledgement of who he is and his ultimate authority. The gospel offers one single and not negotiable path to eternity and assures man that if he persists in his ignorance, once it has been exposed, he will stand before the resurrected Jesus, who will not be the friend and helper that he can be now, but will be the judge which God has <coughs> ordained him to be, and given certification of that by raising him from the dead. Brethren, the time is too short. Now, don't go away from here and say, Paul said the Lord's coming back tomorrow, so we've got to get busy for the rest of the South. Now, I didn't say that. We all hope the Lord will come back soon. We all hope that the Lord will come back before we have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't fear it, but we hope that it won't happen. But brethren, we don't know when the Lord's coming back. The Lord might not come back for another 100 years or another 200 years. What are we going to do in the meantime, in the time that we've got left, before we go home to meet him? The Lord's not going to be interested when we get to heaven in saying, how much time did you spend arguing philosophy? How much time did you spend arguing this or that? How much time did you spend touching people's hearts with the creatorship of God and the piercing gospel of Jesus Christ? Now, I acknowledge myself I've wasted lots of time in ministry that I shouldn't have. I'm saying this as much to you as I'm saying it to myself as I'm saying to you. But brethren, the time is too short to be arguing with the philosophers on Mars Hill. Let's just present the gospel. Let's just present Jesus Christ. Our age is just like Paul's. The religion is different. But people are ignorant of God and need to be made aware of him. And once they're made aware of him, they need to be known, they need to be told that they are responsible to him and will stand before him. We need to make sure that every person with whom we come in contact, family members, if necessary, are confronted with the inflexible claims of Jesus Christ. He is not the unknown God. He can be known. He desires to be known. And he demands that he be proclaimed. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this incredible message by the Apostle Paul to these people. We see that a few people believed and many others went away and said, uh, we'd like to hear some more of this. Well, they just wanted to argue. We thank you, Lord, that the gospel of Jesus Christ found a lodging place in some hearts. And we know, Lord, that your word will always find a lodging place in hearts. It is followed up by the power of your spirit, by the conviction of sin, by the understanding of the immutable nature of God and by the terrifying prospect of judgment. Lord, help us to be useful and faithful servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to be like the Apostle Paul, not sitting around with time on our hands, wondering what to do. Let's find something to do. Let's preach the gospel. Let's talk to people about Jesus Christ. Let's confront them with their sin and their ignorance and the fate that they will face if they do not turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. Father, we pray that you would help us to do this. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless us with joy as we do it, and perhaps, Lord, even the joy of seeing the results of it. And we pray this in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen.